All right, so here we are, the Ventura County Climate Emergency Council regular meeting for Tuesday, July 19, 2022, here at 12.03. Um, the meeting will be conducted via Zoom and telephonically, and um, it's in response to the declared state and local emergencies due to the novel coronavirus and limited public access to the Hall of Administration, consistent with the Governor's Executive Orders N-29-20, this Ventura County Climate Emergency Council meeting will be conducted via Zoom and telephonically. Well, could we have the roll call, please? Absolutely. Council Member White. Here. Council Member Ferris. Here. Chair Schnapp. Here. Council Member Kessley's RSVP is absent. Council Member Ramirez, I do not see in the gallery. I do not hear from her. Council Member Garola. Here. Vice Chair Chavez. Here, thank you. Uh, Council Member Baldwin. Here. Thank you, we have a quorum present. All right, thank you. So let's go ahead and have our Pledge of Allegiance and Council Member Ferris, would you be so kind as to lead us in the pledge? Of course. Thank you. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States, States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. So let's go ahead and move on to item number four, approval of minutes from our May 17, 2022 Climate Emergency Council meeting. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Okay. Moved by Council Member Baldwin. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you. Seconded by Councilmember Ferris. Could we have a roll call, please? Of course. Councilmember White. I'll abstain. I wasn't there. Councilmember Ferris. Yes. Chair Schnapp. Yes. Councilmember Kessley is not here. Councilmember Ramirez is not here. Councilmember Garola. I'll abstain, I was absent. Vice Chair Chavez. Oh. Vice Chair Chavez, if you responded, you may be muted. Sorry. Sure. Vice Chair Chavez? Aye. And Council Member Baldwin? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Let's move on to public comments for items not on the agenda. And so we have received a list of those comments that have come in over the course of time. I believe there might be five comments that were received and one person had sent it had sent comments to us two different times that is correct and we have no more public comments not on the agenda in the inbox each of the comments that we did receive were related to specific agenda items that are on the agenda if anyone in the gallery is interested in making a comment that's not on the agenda at this time please feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you or you can unmute yourself and prepare to speak so is there anyone attending this meeting who would like to make a public comment on items not on the agenda. All right, I don't see anyone who's raised their hand or- I see a hand raised from Jan Dietrich. Oh, okay. So Jan, if you'd like to make a comment not on the agenda, please go ahead and unmute yourself and we'd be happy to hear from you. 
Thank you so much. I want to appreciate what all the council members are, are struggling with here and the news every day makes your work even more of an emergency nature. I'm speaking on behalf of the 350 Ventura County Climate Hub, uh, appreciating uh, also the two recommendations that you um, sent to the Planning Commission last week. Uh, the insurance of adequate local monitoring of the methane emissions is so important for climate mitigation and for health and safety of residents near oil production. I also speak for myself with one of those antiquated wells on my property and uh, being surrounded by uh, wells on a, uh, a permit that was issued in 1945 with that where all of a hundred wells or more can be expanded uh, with, with, without me even knowing about it. Uh, um, that uh, problem that could have been fixed by measures A and B. This is really important, personal for uh, me and my business and my coworkers and my neighbors, um, particularly the well across the trail from us that, um, that we don't even know how long it's been sitting idle or why. So uh, thank you. Thank you for putting a spotlight on this issue. And it couldn't even be more important. I wish, I wish we had had that investigative report in the Desert Sun um, uh, earlier on in your deliberations. And then you would have been absolutely sure that CalGEM the state agency is not even coming remotely close to doing what's necessary in the monitor and the inspection of wells. So appreciation is extended there and we will, we will be advocating for that at, at the board. We also really appreciate the outreach and education program that Dick Baldwin forwarded and, um, and we understand that the sustainability office is actually working on a wonderful platform for that, that I guess it's gonna be called something like Resilient Ventura County. Uh, there's a model of it at uh, Resilient Slow, uh, one of the first cities to actually uh, launch a, a platform for outreach and education about climate. And we're all in all of the 350, uh, uh, grassroots volunteers want uh, want to be uh, very involved with how we go about making sure that that everyone knows everything they can possibly do. Uh, I'm not going to be able to stay in the meeting, so I I want if if that's okay with you to just commend the two items that Phil White is bringing to the agenda for building electrification. Um, it's a no brainer, the first one to decarbonize the county's buildings. And this was actually in the plan. It was something we fought for for four years. And then, I don't know, sadly, Public Works didn't, wasn't ready for that. And the board took it out. So let's get a, a goal back into the general plan to decarbonize as feasible all county facilities. Um, the second of his proposals really just focuses a lot on the um, apparent omission of any programs targeting decarbonization of existing commercial buildings. Um, uh, and so it definitely all, uh, uh, receives our wholehearted support. Um, and we want, you, we want you to pass that on to the planning commission. Um, what we ultimately would like to see is a comprehensive uh, a, a, a analysis of all of the programs the county is offering what that are uh, that are not specified in the climate action plan that uh, that, that cover all buildings and re, re, new and existing residential commercial and industrial uh, so so that uh, and, and so that we can see that, that there are really solid, ambitious programs. And I can't stress enough how important this is. You know, we often hear, oh, the county unincorporated area, those emissions aren't that great. Believe me, you're 
example to the cities is humongous. They aren't listening to us. We need an example from the county showing really strong policies so that city officials in Oxnard, Ventura, Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, so that they'll listen to us about the importance of getting these ordinances passed really ASAP. Everything is urgent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Is there anyone else who'd like to make public comments during um, this time on the agenda? And this is for items that are not on the agenda. So you can go ahead and raise your hand or um, take yourself off of mute. Chair, I do not see any hands raised in the gallery. All right. Thank you so much. So let's move on then to, um, we do have a correspondence agenda. That's items six through 10 uh, that the committee has received. Anything else, Clay, on that item? Nothing specific to note on that, although one of the public comments that was received earlier today, and those public comments have all been posted to the Climate Emergency Council's website. One of the public comments that was received was related to correspondence in item six here but there's no action requested of the Climate Emergency Council on correspondence agenda items. Okay, very good. Let's move on to item number 11 then, the resolution authorizing the remote teleconference meetings for the Ventura County Climate Emergency Council for 30 day period pursuant to the government code section 54953 subdivision E of the Ralph M. Brown Act. Go ahead, Clay. If uh, there would need to be a motion in a second, then we can move forward. Or unless there's discussion or questions. Is there any discussion on this item? Yes, go ahead, Council Member White. I'll, I'll move approval. All right, thank you. Madam Chair. Second. Second by Council Member Baldwin. Um, Vice Chair Chavez, did you have a question? Yes, I had a question to Clay. Um, since we missed our, since our last uh, meeting was essentially canceled due to a lack of items. Um, were we technically allowed to be meeting virtually today? We, according to county council, we still substantially comply because we are making a good faith effort to stay within the bounds of what that calls for. And so my conversation with county council has indicated that we should make every effort to have regular meetings that are within that 30 day period. But if there is something that's, you're not required to, it's my understanding, from conversation with county council. We are not required to meet just to move that motion forward. If that changes or I'm told otherwise, I will certainly bring it to the attention of your council though. Okay, and are we looking at maybe one day moving to in-person? Um, I know a lot of city councils, legislative bodies are either doing a hybrid option or they've all returned back to in-person. The that is, that is up to this council. If, if I'm told that, that you all would like to try doing a hybrid option, I can try and find a, a meeting place to make that happen. But um, that's not something that's been brought to my attention. I would caution that the last two years the, and right now, the COVID infection rates typically go up during the summertime while people are traveling and doing those sorts of things. So if you did wanna do it, I would, uh, as a non-healthcare professional, uh, recommend that you consider doing so perhaps in September when the trends would theoretically have be, be somewhat lower. Um, but if, if something like a hybrid option is desirable, we can make that happen and would be happy to look into it for the council. I appreciate that. And I wasn't expecting anything time soon. You know, a lot of legislative bodies go dark in August. So um, just something for us to think about. I know a few of those comments were made at a couple of meetings ago about getting back to in person. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Clay. You're welcome, thank you. So there's a motion and a second. So unless there's any further discussion, um, could we have a roll call please? Okay, Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Ferris. Yes. Chair Schnapp. Yes. Council Member Garola. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Council Member Baldwin. Yes. Motion passes. All right, thank you. Let's move on then to item number 12, which is the update from the County Executive Office staff. Go ahead, Clay. Thank you. So the, the main thing, and I won't put stuff in front of it because 
it's probably less important. I don't want to bury the lead. But so we did go to the Planning Commission on July 7th. So I took the two proposals from this group that were approved in March of this year. And so those included the education um, program, rec education outreach recommendation. And that also included the proposal for um, for adoption of a resolution supporting efforts to cap methane leaks from oil and gas wells and pipelines. And so one of the things to keep in mind is when we went there, we weren't asking the planning commission to approve or not approve anything that came from this council because that is not their role and their relationship to your proposals. But in the resolution that created the Climate Emergency Council, it directs staff to take proposals from the Climate Emergency Council to the planning commission so that they too can, they can make comments on those. And so what they essentially did is if anyone went through it, um, they, they broke things up into a couple of motions. And so they just kind of generally supported a kind of a staff recommendation related to the climate change public outreach and education program. As we did the analysis and as I worked with the planning division specifically, one of the things that came up is we looked at the, the way that the language in the proposal worked and the all of those, those various policies and programs in the, in the general plan that were generally supportive of this proposal. And um, what came out was our interpretation as staff was that this program could potentially move forward being consistent with the climate action plan without actually requiring a general plan adoption. So that was what we proposed was that, the, that it be considered if if uh, the board were to choose to adopt that they do so without a general plan amendment because it could happen faster and it could happen much less expensively to do so. So those were those two items. And the, um, the planning commission was generally supportive of, of that approach rather than feeling that there was a requirement for a general plan amendment, which one of the reasons rationale for going to the planning commission could be interpreted as going there so that they can look at the nexus with the general plan of proposals that come out of this council. So that seemed a relatively appropriate place to get them to weigh in. Then the, the proposal to adopt a resolution supporting efforts to cap methane leaks from oil and gas wells. There were a few other comments that were attached to that. The, I would say that for both of these proposals, the Planning Commission was generally supportive. And so they just added additional comments to both of them or added a few additional comments to this one. Although I would say one of these comments, which was a request for the board to consider clarifying the Climate Emergency Council's charter and purpose, including references to quantifiable reductions to greenhouse gas emissions. They basically, um, it was included in this comment, but much of the discussion actually kind of had it as the Climate Emergency Council and proposals in general. And there are a couple other comments. I wanted to backtrack a moment and say that the minutes for the Planning Commission hearing are not out yet. And so once those are out to clarify what the actions were, what the comments were, because they're minutes, they're gonna be a kind of a statement by, by minute order, then I'm gonna circulate those to the Climate Emergency Council and make those available. So anyone could get those from the Planning Commission, but I'm gonna make sure that that gets circulated to this council so that when those are available and their next tentative hearing is scheduled for July 28th, or tentatively scheduled for July 28th, I should say, and so at that time, when those planning commission minutes are available, I'll circulate these to the council. And that way they'll show up on your correspondence agenda too. So any members of the public that are interested should be able to find it there. The other comments that were included in the motion associated with the resolution supporting efforts to cap methane leaks from oil and gas wells and pipelines. Um, they recommended consideration of quantifying the greenhouse gas emissions from idle, abandoned orphan wells to the extent available. We did not go into an an in-depth conversation of to what extent those are available because each definition that you have in that idle abandoned and orphan wells, there's different data availability with each of those, but we expect in preparation for the Board of Supervisors, we'll try and address that comment to the extent possible. They also recommended that the board consider adding the actual greenhouse gas emissions numbers attached to greenhouse gas initiatives greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and goals, that those be added to the general plan. And that's a reference to programs or policies in the general plan, COS 10.2 and COS 10.3, which give a percent reduction, but they don't list the actual figures for the greenhouse gas or carbon dioxide equivalent reductions, although those figures are available in Appendix B um, of the general plan. And then the last item they asked that the board consider the comment letter submitted um, by Todd Collard dated July 6th. 
And so there are various things that were recommended in that letter, and they recommend that the board consider that um, as they conduct their deliberations in the future. These proposals are tentatively scheduled to appear before the board on September 20th. Um, we will have a time certain item. I'm hesitant to say that now out loud on a recording because those change a lot. And I don't wanna mislead anyone with information that could very well be dated by the time we get to September. So um, it will be times, it's expected to be time certain though. Um, so those are, those are what we have in front of us for those items. And that is all I have, I believe for now on this item. And I have two other quick, quick items and I'll be happy to take any questions, particularly if there are any for this planning commission item. I also wanted to note, particularly since we didn't get together in June, that there was a, a new version of the budget and staffing plan for climate action plan implementation that was released and is on the sustainability division website at sustain.ventura.org on our resources page. And so that's something that it was used in the annual budgeting process this year. And so it was referenced in, I believe it was attachment A to the budget, and then it's maintained on the sustainability division website. But that was again, another interagency effort to consider all of the cap related programs across all seven agencies that have at least one assignment to them through amongst the 81 different programs that are part of the climate action plan. And then my last item I wanted to mention is that the Climate Emergency Council website still hasn't changed yet from its temporary location, but that is still pending. Started trying to draft up and figure out how to integrate the temporary site that we have now into the sustainability division's new site at sustain.ventura.org. So you won't have seen anything change at this time, but in the future, you could see that change. And I just wanna make sure that when we set that up, that the navigation and materials are readily available, easy to use, and those sorts of things. Just a lot of information to kind of pile in, particularly with the, the ongoing agendas and those sorts of things. So we wanna make sure that for any users, that's not gonna to be too challenging. So you will see a change, but no one will actually need to do anything because the URL that we use now, ventura.org slash VCCEC, that will continue to be active and it will just direct people to that Climate Emergency Council page even once it changes locations. So, and that's it for my update for today. But if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, thank you, Clay. Any questions for Clay from the council? Good. Okay. Just one yes, more question. Ahead, Council Member Ferris. Can can you can you elaborate a little bit if you if you're able? Um, and and maybe this is something that's more uh, we'll wait for the minutes. But you had mentioned that there were comments from the Planning Commission regarding the the, the council this council's role with respect to the quantifiable. Then can you give a little bit more color uh, as to what, what what they were inquiring about and kind of making sure that we're in line with what. Uh, others' expectations are for this council? Sure. So some of the discussion and the, and I would say the recording's available as well. So anyone can go look at that recording if you choose to. It is like these, like these meetings. It's kind of lengthy. So someone has to set aside some time, but it really revolved around the fact that there's, there's an, ex, in the resolution, as well as in um, the resolution that creates this, this body, there is a direction to, um, to seek reductions and quantify the reductions associated with these proposals. And neither of the proposals that went to the planning commission did. And so they didn't necessarily feel like it was, this is my impression, this is not in the minutes, but they didn't necessarily think that those made, um, made those proposals without value, but they, had, they were wondering more of, is there a discrepancy between what the Climate Emergency Council has been asked to do and what it has completed? And is that a problem? And if it's okay to not have that quantification known in these proposals, then that, that's the clarification they're seeking that the board consider perhaps, and I, I'm interpreting this, but that, they, that something be changed or clarified in that resolution or in the bylaws that you know, to the, if, if quantification is not available, what does that mean? Is that acceptable? Is it not acceptable? Is it um, something in between? And so there was, there was a fair bit of discussion but, um, at, on that topic between the various council members. Okay. Um, just as a follow-up, because I think that in, in the deliberations for this, this body on those recommendations, there was a lot of back and forth of you know, bringing the proposal up and then going back and saying, you know, they're asking us to quantify. Can you actually identify if you implement this program, what do we think the reductions will actually be? What do we think it'll cost? And we provided that, that information as part of the recommendation. 
was it viewed by the planning commission that that was not sufficient it did not meet any like in other words whatever the work we did have done or the approach we're taking it was not viewed as providing any quantifiable understanding and maybe then the reconciliation is go back to the board and go you know you asked for quantification what are you looking for here because that could be a lot of work and it might not even be possible is that is that is that what was the the discussion point to the planning commission so one of the things and this could be something that you know staff we're going to try and address this to the extent possible when we go to the board knowing that that question is there that they're asking for consideration um the way that the items were presented to the board was more as the, the substantial, the proposals themselves. So for the second proposal, the methane um, related one for oil and gas facilities, that one was presented essentially as a resolution for adoption. We presented the resolution, but we didn't include in the agenda materials, the deliberative materials. And this was a conversation with planning and how planning commission hearings usually work. So those evaluation criteria were not submitted as part of it. And they were made aware that the deliberative materials were available through the Climate Emergency Council's website and agenda packet materials. And so it's possible that we'll be referencing or including some of those materials to go into discussion with the board on to the, the extent that the, the Climate Emergency Council pursued quantification, attempted to conduct quantification, and at least advise them that that was part of the deliberative process to attempt to find those without being excessively speculative, which would be, that would be my interpretation of it's not that no one, it's, it certainly didn't appear that for any of those proposals, there wasn't an attempt to conduct quantification of, of the reasonably, you know, what you could foresee in those GHG reductions. But for things like the education program, a number that you came up with could be so speculative to not have significant value. And so it was seemed in those proposals so appropriate to say that they weren't quantifiable because it would be excessively speculative. So was it, was is it more in the fact of the, that 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 quantifiable information was provided to them, but they discounted it? Or was it that it was available, but it wasn't in front of them, so they may have interpreted that there was no quantifiable information provided? The I don't think it was that they didn't know that. They were aware that those deliberative materials had been there. Um, staff told them that we were that that quantification could not occur due to the nature of the proposals. But to the extent possible, quantification had been attempted. So they were aware that that information was there. And the, for example, the availability of the evaluation criteria and that information, they were informed that that information was available. So some of those planning commission, at least some of the planning commissioners did go look at that information, did look into those deliberative materials, but it was determined that that might be too deep a dive and that those were truly deliberative for the Climate Emergency Council. Um, we tried to make sure that when we presented to the Planning Commission that it was clear on what the proposal was, what the rationale was, and what those sorts of things were. But I don't think it was, I believe that the, that the Planning Commission knew that those materials were available. Their main question was more holistic for the Climate Emergency Council and what the expectations were for the council. If quantification cannot occur, is that acceptable? And I think that they're really looking for that question to be answered or clarified by the board in a more holistic perspective and some of those comments. Yeah, well, last comment I think is, I think we're gonna need that because I think we're wrestling with this on every proposal that we have that hasn't already been put into the action plan. How do you quantify some to where it's kind of nebulous and we're trying to do our best to, to, to provide that? Um, you know, if it takes a lot of energy and resources to quantify it, we can do that, but they need to agree to spend the money on a lot of studies to get, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a circle here. That's that, circular. Uh, you need to figure out how to support or get better understanding of how we can be supportive for them. Well, great. All right, I see uh, Council Member White, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you, Clay, for that summary. I'm, I'm happy that that, that went to the planning commission sound like it went well. Um, I, I just want to point out that in the, in the general plan that was adopted in 2020 and the climate action plan that's a part of that, the marching orders to um, the Climate Emergency Council 
are broader than quantifying emission reductions of proposals. In fact, the words are in there to advise the board on what it can do for climate action. I'm paraphrasing, I don't have the exact words in front of me, but the way I read the, the second part of that is that anything that we feel is important for the board to take action on, whether it's something that has quantifiable emission reductions or not, is fair game for, for our council. And I'll give an example of something that um, we've talked about as a possible proposal that, that I intend to talk about later, the last item on the agenda is a proposal to, to have the Board of Supervisors declare a climate emergency. Um, that is certainly not something that would come with quantifiable emission reductions, but I personally feel that that's an important uh, proposal that could come from, uh, from our council. So I think we need to, uh, to be reminded of the complete marching orders um, in, the, in the general plan uh, for, for our group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments from council members? Go ahead, council member Baldwin. And, and by the way, council member Baldwin was there um, at the meeting. I was watching the meeting online. And so thank you for representing our group when you were called to um, answer some questions. So go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. I, uh, I think I was there as a, as a citizen, not, not for the council, but, um, but I had a lot of heart in it. Uh, when we talk about quantification, quantification was my lifeblood for about 31 years. Um, getting quantification on emissions is, is a real pain. It, you cannot imagine the amount of money that our pollution control agencies spend Measuring emissions and and uh, and measure and, and matching those with the process factors to figure out how much is going out on a per unit basis, whether it's BTUs or pounds per hour, uh, cubic feet or something. It's a difficult thing to do, and the thing that's floating through my mind right now is all of these uncapped wells and poorly capped wells and, and what have you. And there's a strong desire to somehow find a way to get out and cap these things that should have been capped properly and aren't. And you try to look at what are the emission reductions. And I will tell you as a professional that monitored emissions for decades that unless you physically measure them, you can't. All you can do is make estimates, just loose estimates because one, a whole lot of these things aren't even known if they're leaking. Two, nobody knows to the extent how much they're leaking because we don't know how poorly they're sealed or how well they're sealed. And so there is a huge amount of ambiguity in terms of each leak as to how much is coming up, how many leaks are there and people are that these drones are just now beginning to find out, oh, look, there's leaks over here and there's leaks over there that nobody even knew about. And, and it goes on with, with other things, just trying to do the quantification of these soft things. Um, unless you physically do measurements, we're not gonna get accurate stuff. And so people need to learn to accept the fact that, are we going in the right direction? Will emissions be reduced? How well will they be reduced? Is it physically possible to do it? We need to look at the practical things. If you want to get in a cost effectiveness, they're, they're going to, the county's going to have to come up with another million or two million bucks for uh, engineering firms that go out and do all the measurements on these things because the quantification is expensive, it's difficult, it takes time. So I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other? 
comments from council members or questions. All right, and so um, are there any questions from the community and public comments? So Roseanne, I see your hand up, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to mention having watched the proceedings during the time the county was considering its climate action plan that it was my impression that a lot of the reason why the items that are listed on the CEC's agenda for consideration were done so because the county did not have the resources to quantify the emissions reductions from those items. So it's kind of um, unrealistic to expect the CEC to have the resources to quantify something that the county was unable to do itself. And if the CEC is expected to make those quantifications, it will need the resources to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And then I see um, Todd Collard followed by Kathleen Wheeler. Go ahead. Yeah, my response quickly is to comments that uh, Mr. Baldwin made about the expense posed to the county to the monitoring of methane might reach a million dollars or so. It's probably unknown, but would be very expensive. I maintain the methane leaks are a product of the oil industry and they should be paying for that monitoring. Uh, the county's permitting system, which I oversaw for decades, uh, allows for permit conditions to require monitoring at the expense of the permittee. And that was the case for not just the oil industry, but for all permittees. Mining, sand and gravel is another case example of a large extractive industry that required regular monitoring and was paid for by that industry. So I think we need to look back to who's creating the problem and find ways to deal with that. Uh, ordinances such as A and B were one approach, but modifying permits to require uh, payment of staffing fees, whether to outside consultants, Mr. Ba uh, Baldwin alluded to, or to city or county staff, that remains to be seen. But I shouldn't, I don't think we should let the financial burden of trying to monitor the emissions from the oil field fall to the county and the public. It should fall on the industry. Thank you. Thank you. So go ahead, Kathleen Wheeler, followed by Kristen Kessler. Hi, uh, I just wanted to comment quickly on the issue of quantification, which I think is a challenge. Uh, but one of the exciting things that is happening is when cities learn from each other and is a very respectable and legitimate way to go to go with what works, what other cities are finding from their measurements and uh, can be reliably um, duplicated. Um, also modeling, I think, is one way to do measuring that, that gives us at least an approximation of the amount of reduction possible. So those two points, I think, uh, are important. And we can't let quantification perfect quantification be an obstacle to movement. Thank you. Thank you. And so go ahead, Kristen Kessler. Hey, thank you. Um, just in terms of methane, um, you know, I understand there may be issues with quantifying it, but um, it, it is a, a greenhouse gas that is 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And I don't think that it should be taken lightly. And the other thing is um, just, reiterating Todd's question about um, the oil industry was able to spend $8 million defeating measures A and B. So why do, not, do they not have the resources to um, plug up these leaks from these wells? Thank you. Yes, good point. Oops. Thank you. Um, anyone else from the public wanting to make a comment here for this Simon? Go ahead and raise your hand. Um, I don't see anyone else. Okay. Um, anything else that you'd like to share at this time, Clay? No, that's it for me today, but per normal, um, and if there are any questions following this meeting, then members of the public or members of this council are welcome to reach out to me. I'd be happy to speak with folks. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's move on then to item number 13. A request for the Ventura County Climate Emergency Council to approve a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to revise general plan policy COS 8.6 policy 
CFS 2.2 and program COS T to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from county owned facilities. So we've identified about 25 minutes here, and this presentation is going to be made by Council Member White. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. Um, um, Clay, could you put up the, the greenhouse gas emission pie chart um, screen share that so we can look at it? Yes, I can. Just one moment while I pull that up. While he's pulling that up, um, I, I just want to say that, that I've been working on uh, proposals for buildings and stationary sources. Um, and if you look at the, the pie chart there, the two blue uh, pieces of pie at the top are the ones that, um, that I've been focusing on. Um, coming from the other issues tack, which was everything not covered by the other tax like transportation, agriculture, solid waste. And I understand that the tax have gone away. I wasn't at the meeting uh, when that happened, but um, I think it's a good idea that, that, that they did go away. Um, and that each of us on the, on the council could come forward with um, proposed actions to the board uh, from any, any of these um, pieces of pie or anything related to climate at all. Um, so what, what I have today are two proposals uh, that relate to building energy. And, um, you know, they've come, I brought, brought them before uh, the council previously uh, as draft proposals to, uh, to get feedback from uh, other mem members of the council. So the, the first one is, is related to reducing emissions from the county's own buildings and facilities in Clay, if you could please put up um, on the screen the, the first page of that. Just one moment while I pull that up. I just want to make sure we've got the right version of that available. The county has a lot of buildings. Um, I think the number is uh, over 3 million square feet of, uh, of buildings. It's, it's amazing to think about. A hundred and forty eight facilities. Um, and many of these Many of these buildings uh, include um, energy systems that, <clears throat> that burn natural gas or propane. Um, and of course, um, electrification of buildings is one of the main um, goals for um, attacking the, the climate change problem in the, in the planet. And so systematically reducing um, um, natural gas combustion in buildings is, is a strong um, tactic for, um, for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll use the example of, um, of my own house here in Ojai, uh, where my wife and I are on a, um, on track to um, <clears throat> reduce our greenhouse gas emissions <clears throat> by um, electrifying the, the energy systems in our house. And we've already done uh, hot water heating by, by putting in um, a solar hot water heater with um, electric backup. Um, we, 
uh, are just about to install both uh, an induction cooktop in the kitchen that will eliminate the natural gas cooktop that we have now and replace it with one that uh, uses electricity. And we're also um, very close to embarking on um, replacing our furnace for heating the house um, with a heat pump system. Um, so reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in buildings is very important. The, the blue piece of pie um, is large and uh, this is something that humanity needs to be doing and we need to be doing here in Ventura County. So the first proposal for county facilities follows the, the policy decision that the Board of Supervisors already made uh, in 2020. Um, Dick Baldwin and I, before, um, before the CEC was created and we were made uh, members of the CEC, we lobbied the Board of Supervisors to adopt a policy on vehicles that would uh, replace natural, uh, excuse me, uh, gasoline powered, diesel powered vehicles um, with electric vehicles. And that the board um, did adopt this policy, thereby um, reducing the county's own greenhouse gas emissions and setting a good example for, um, for the other cities in the county and for other counties. And so what this proposal is in front of us today is, is um, to suggest to the Board of Supervisors that they also adopt a policy to electrify county facilities, county buildings and facilities uh, and I want to use really emphasize where feasible. Um, there, there, there may be certain um, operations and county facilities that are burning natural gas that would be extremely difficult to replace with electrical systems. Uh, and so the the proposal is is basically adopt a policy to electrify county buildings where feasible. Um, now, Clay, uh, I've worked with Clay on the details of, um, of this proposal and, and Clay did a really good job of um, tying it into the already adopted uh, general plan uh, policies and programs. If you could scroll up to where you're, um, yeah, right there. Um, <clears throat> there obviously are existing policies in the general plan that deal with um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And so what, what Clay has helped me do here is to modify the existing policies with the red text underlined um, to, to make it a policy to support the transition to zero net carbon buildings, both new and existing, uh, including county owned facilities. Um, what, what would happen if, if the board agrees with this, if we, if we adopt it in our, our group, our council, and pass it through the planning commission to the board and the board says yes, then that would be direction to, to county staff, um, GSA and public works particularly, that they, um, they look to um, electrifying those facilities where, where it's feasible to do so, where it makes sense, um, just as they did with um, the policy on electric vehicles. 
So um, that in a nutshell is, is this proposal. Um, I think it makes, makes a lot of sense that as far as emission reductions. I, I think um, what we have here applies, um, looks at the existing emissions attributable to uh, um, county facilities and estimates um, that, if, that if they comply with the emission reductions contained overall in the general plan that um, we, would, um, we would reduce emissions accordingly. Now, there's no promise that those goals will be achieved, but that's the best cut at um, reducing emissions and quantifying what those would be. So at the very bottom there, do you see the, just above the bottom there, the goal of reducing natural gas and propane using at county-owned facilities to no more than 711,000 therms annually by 2030, et cetera. These would be the goals. Um, so anyway, I, I think this is an important uh, step that the board should take um, to do what it can to uh, encourage its own staff to work towards um, electrification of buildings and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, thank you, Council Member White. Um, do we have questions from the other council members? You know, just to make mention here, as I like when you, you spoke about where we're feasible, although I don't see that term in this document, I think it's something that could be considered um, uh, when we take this up for motion. But are there any questions or comments from the other council members? So I see uh, Vice Chair Chavez, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Councilmember White, for your presentation. A couple of questions, and you may or may not have the information for this. Um, when the tax were still in formation, myself and Councilmember Baldwin, we were on the transportation tax. One of the things that came out was that uh, many other departments within the county have a specific department budget uh, that they utilize for purchasing vehicles or whatever it may be. So many of them didn't want to transition to electrifying the vehicle fleet. Are you aware of any budget impacts that each department may face by transitioning to an electrification in the departments? or within the building sites? I, I don't have specific information on the budgets, but kind of in a nutshell, um, here's how, how the county typically works with its buildings. Um, like all mechanical equipment, um, the energy related equipment in buildings um, gets to the end of its useful life and needs to be replaced. And the, the county um, issues contracts to contractors to change out the equipment, replace it with uh, hopefully more efficient, um, energy efficient equipment, for example. Th this is when it typically happens. And at that point in reviewing uh, existing building mechanical equipment, the, the, the county has the option for continuing with natural gas systems or continue or to make a change to electric systems. A good example would be a building and the county has a bunch of them that, that utilize um, Let's take the example of uh, package rooftop equipment that provides air conditioning and um, systems that use natural gas um, can be replaced with heat pump systems 
that utilize the same ductwork, the uh, typically the same electrical connections, um, same um, condensate drain connections, and they can make this. And it's important to note that uh, the economics of uh, conversion to heat pump systems, because Mara White, I, I'm sorry. Um, I it was just a question in regards to the budget, but it sounds like you're giving another presentation. So um, I'll just go ahead and end my questions there. And if anything else comes up, I'll go ahead and ask. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Any other questions from the council members? Yes, go ahead, Council Member Ferris. So um, thanks, and uh, I guess, I think as a uh, church now had, had mentioned, sort of the where feasible um, probably seems like it may be doing a lot of work uh, there with respect to providing the guidance uh, that's there. But would it be advisable for us? Because what I worry about is it's possible we say feasible and everybody's like, well, did they go to their department? They're like, well, it's not feasible. So they just don't they just don't think about doing anything or rightly they say, I don't want to have to spend the budget I have in order to swap out and change change things in there. But might we provide a trigger as part of this policy that says if there's any consideration of enhancement, upgrade, maintenance, whatever that might be, that they must consider and evaluate electrical electrification systems as part of that. It may cost a little more, or whatever, but but giving them that forcing function to be able to say, look, you need to consider this as part of your upgrade and maintenance of existing buildings to get them to think about it as opposed to easily wipe it away with a, well, it's not feasible and so therefore they don't, they don't think about it. Is it uh, from council member White's view, is that something that is, would, in, would enhance this or basically fine tune it? I'm just trying to get your sense of uh, the intent for the, the policy recommendation. Um, a good point, and, and Sylvia, a good point you made on uh, where feasible, and, and I'm pretty sure we do have uh, the words uh, where feasible in the text of this proposal that would go forward to the board. I'm, I'm certainly willing to, uh, to add that, what you, what you suggested, uh, Mick, uh, if you could... Um, to, to what you're thinking there. Um, I would, I'd be happy to, I would love to hear uh, other members of the council with respect to consideration of, of at least that aspect. And the real only reason I'm thinking about it is I can see departments or building, you know, managers of it immediately saying, well, I, there's no way I'm going to spend all my budget because someone told me to swap out my my heating system, but if they're already thinking about it, then maybe that's something they need to, to be told to consider. Um, the only other thing comes back to is that, that that gets into what the costs of it are. So if they're already thinking about upgrading it, they're already thinking about spending money to put money into the building, they may as well be thinking about climate action at the same time. And, you know, I guess my answer to that is that it's, it's kind of like what the board already did on vehicles, um, suggesting that um, when replacing vehicles, they, they look to uh, electric vehicles first, that that becomes a policy. And it's, it's applying the, the same kind of policy to building systems. And so the the people in the county, the, the departments in the county would say, okay, it's board policy to electrify where it makes sense. Um, so I would think that would be enough to uh, yeah. cause them to think I, about it. I, I know you did, but I, because you hung up right away, but then. Thank, thank you. It sounded like somebody was uh, not on me. Uh, go ahead, um, uh, Council Member Harris, did you have yeah, a think just. Just as one final part, I think, I, I think that's the, the part of, by describing exactly the situation for which they should be thinking about it, 
it gets them it, it gives them less of a rationale to kind of dismiss it as as something that's easily dismissed um, if they're already considering spending money to upgrade maintain replace equipment within their buildings then we sh they should be thinking about it's the only reason i think of that. i could just see decision makers easily dismissing saying well it's just going to be way too much i'm not going to Well, if you have some words that would um, would say what what you're suggesting, I'm I'm agreeable to uh, incorporate those. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments from council members before we open it up for public comment? So go ahead, Council Member Gorola. Well, this question is probably for Clay. Uh, the numbers that were presented as far as the uh, square footage and total facilities, does that take into account uh, uh, the other districts that are out there that are uh, run by the county? It takes into account the, the agencies that are part of the county family of agencies, but it does not include things that would be considered special districts and whatnot. And I, I would note that we've got Dave Sasek on the call here today, and he's the agency director for general services agency. They don't have complete control over every facility that is managed by every agency, but he is here and he was, he was interested in making some comments about general services agency alongside other comments, but that was going to, I was going to wait to introduce him until we get past the, uh, the questions for council member white. Um, but if we want distinctions on what those numbers hold, those are, those are approximate numbers. There's always kind of a, well, it includes this, but it doesn't include that and those sorts of things, whether it improves, for example, enterprise facilities or non-enterprise facilities and, and those sorts of things. But these are ballpark for the facilities that, um, that the county manages. Okay, thank you. And then just a, a follow-up. I don't know if there's been, maybe the gentleman from GSA can answer, there's been any uh, emission uh, surveys from, from the facilities that we're talking about. I can tell you what numbers were used because I did the query for on behalf of Council Member White when he was asked. And so there's a database that's used that's related to energy management through General Services Agency. And it's kind of attached to billing. So it's one of the more, I thought it was a fantastic database for aggregating what we do, where we do it, how much we're spending on it, that sort of thing. And so what it was is we looked at natural gas and propane use across all of those facilities. And so that takes about 500 different accounts for different types of utility usage. And, and those are accounts that might be more than one account for building and those sorts of things. So it really does consolidate a lot of that information. So it's a very high level look when you start getting into that natural gas. Thank you, sir, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And then with that, um, let's go ahead and open it for public comments. But um, before I call on the public, I know that one of them was our, is our GSA um, director. And so Clay, do you wanna go ahead and introduce him? Sure. Uh, so we have Dave Sasek with us, who's Agency Director for General Services Agency. And uh, Dave, if you'd like to introduce yourself or make any further comments, please do. Yeah, thank you, Clay. Um, yeah, so for the record, uh, Dave Sasek, the Director of the General Services Agency. Uh, Chair Schnapp, it's good to see you again. Um, council members, thank you for giving me a few minutes to, uh, to speak to you. Um, I want to first begin by the question came up about budgetary, the budgetary impacts of this. And, you know, the first thing I want to mention is the way the county is set up is we're, we're run, um, there's a couple different ways where, we, where we're running our budget for facilities management. I'm responsible for about 3 million square feet of about 114 buildings that are run what, through what's called an internal service fund which essentially means I'm responsible for operating and maintaining all the buildings. And I charge the other agencies that are within those buildings a fee to be in the building. And that fee covers building maintenance, housekeeping, grounds, security, and utilities. And so that's, uh, I, I think that 3 million number is, is uh, small because it doesn't include the enterprise funds that I don't necessarily have responsibility for. And the biggest enterprise fund that I think I want to focus a little bit of time on is the healthcare agency. 
because the healthcare agency is the largest user of natural gas and it's at the hospital. Um, so when, when we start looking at the reduction goals and the targets, um, we can't even achieve the first goal by 2030 without impacting and actually attacking the gas use utilization at the, at the VCMC. I'm not responsible for that facility. They manage their own facility over there. I will say that you know, one of the obstacles to this whole goal or objective is the practical engineering aspect of it in the sense that um, you know, in, in order to replace these, we're not talking about a little um, water heater that you have at your house or a small system. We're talking about large industrial systems that will draw a tremendous amount of power if we switch from gas to electric. And so, so for example, when you look at, at VCMC, and we, by the way, we only got this report late last week. So my energy manager really only had Friday and yesterday to look at this to try to figure out, hey, what's technically feasible? Is it possible? What are the impacts? Because one of my goals is to provide the policymakers with enough information that they can make an informed decision. So I think earlier there was a conversation about comprehensive analysis and providing good input. That's my goal. I don't set policy, but I think I owe it to the policymakers to make sure they understand the impacts of the decisions that they make. So, so when you start looking at our natural gas use, there's really three facilities that use the vast majority of the natural gas that the county consumes. The first one is the healthcare, uh, the hospital. Uh, the second one is the government center, which is essentially supporting the main jail. Uh, and the third one is the Todd Road Jail. So those, those are large industrial boilers, hot water heaters. They create steam. Um, they use them for, um, for cooking, for heat, for cleaning uh, at the healthcare. At the, again, I, I'm not an expert on what they do at the hospital. I know a little bit about it, um, but they have requirements that they need for sanitation. We can't even achieve the first goal by 2030 without if we eliminate all the natural gas uh, at Todd Road Jail and here at the government center, we still wouldn't meet the 2030 goal. So one of the concerns that I have, I love the fact that uh, Council Member White, you said we're feasible. I get concerned because I see specific targets and goals in given years. Um, that kind of negates the we're feasible concept because now you're giving me direct targets and goals that I have to meet by a timeline. And, and people look at that. So, I, you know, again, I, I think we need to do a little bit more research just from the back of the napkin. If we go with electric and replacing the natural gas, another impact on the budget. Again, we didn't have a lot of time to look at this, but my energy manager, we right now we pay about $22 million a year for electricity. If we switch these three systems over to electricity, that bill goes up to 29 million. So it's a big increase in cost. And I'm not saying that to, to, to advocate for or against. Again, I don't make policy, but I think policymakers need to see the impact of, of, their, of their decisions. The other thing is when we start looking at, um, like at the hospital, again, my guy looked and he said, I think we're gonna have to um, maybe add another 50 to 70% to the load in order to support the electrical uh, usage there. The system, you know, the transformers, the electrical service, all that, none of that size for that kind of increase. So you're talking about a massive engineering effort, design, and then investing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in infrastructure. And we see the same problem here at the government center if we were to try to switch from natural gas to electric. Um, the other thing that I think is worth considering as you go forward with this is, you know, the fact that we, we, have, um, we have renewable natural gas that's being generated here in the county. Some of it we own because it's being generated from county owned facilities, but, there, but that's an opportunity to, to take gas that's gotta be dealt with one way or another based on federal and state laws. And if we can, uh, if we can take advantage of that, you know, instead of investing and paying millions and millions of dollars to make this change, uh, maybe we can find a way that we could tap into that 
renewable natural gas and save the taxpayers some money. The, 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 uh, and I know I'm talking a lot, I'm saying a lot, I'm more than happy to answer a lot of questions. I noticed that a big part of that pie chart was transportation. So again, as a, as a person that doesn't set policy, but advises policymakers, if I was going to invest millions and millions of dollars, I might think it's a wiser choice to invest that money to do electrification because the county's going to have their, the, the, the low hanging fruit. Um, you know, we've been working with Southern Cal Edison to get grants. We've been working with the Air Pollution Control District. Uh, but in order for the county to get our fleet electrified, the county is going to have to invest millions of dollars, not just in the vehicles, but also in the infrastructure, because the same challenge occurs when you increase the electrical load. You got to get the service to the place where you need that load. So let me see. I, I made a number of notes here. Um, yeah, so I talked about the budget system. I, I think, um, you know, where feasible, maybe taking some of these goals and timelines in the years out would make, you know, make it easier for us to, to line up behind this. And to talk about the policy that the county put in place as it relates to, to um, electric vehicles, one, the, the most important aspect of that was we were asked to make economic analysis. So in other words, if it's gonna cost, the current policy as it stands right now is where it makes economic sense. And what that means is if we can put an electric vehicle in place of a gas powered internal combustion engine and the cost is the wash, then we go with the electrical. We don't have a charter or a direction from our board to spend extra money to electrify. As a matter of fact, when we went for Charge Ready One for the first set of EVs we got here, we actually had to go to the board and request a budgetary increase to accept that grant to offset the county fair share of that grant. So again, I, I'm not a policy maker. I just think it's important that we do our due diligence. And we, you know, when I looked at the analysis, and again, didn't have a lot of time to study it, but you know, at the bottom where it goes through the little checklist, I think you know it was, there was a, a significant downplay on the cost and the investment. Um, again, it may be more or less than what we looked at over the last couple of days, but this is not an insignificant effort. And so I would ask the board think about, you know, think about, you know, I like the idea of where feasible. I, I'm very concerned that there's a list of target years and emission goals, because that makes where feasible really, um, that's like any sentence that you put, I, I, I believe this and that, but, you know, everything before the but gets re re forgotten and the but is what you focus on. So I would ask that the board consider that. And then if this is gonna go forward, I would also ask that a little bit more staff work go into that, you know, maybe consulting with me and my team, with the healthcare agency and their team to figure out, okay, what, what is possible? They just built a, what, $400 million new hospital wing. They have three or four huge gas powered boilers they just put in there, right? So that would all have to be retrofitted. I mean, millions of dollars of new equipment would have to be pulled out and we can't meet that 2030 goal without looking at the healthcare agency in the hospital. So I'm open to any questions. And again, I think develop this idea more and put the decision, you know, put the facts and put those pros and cons in front of the policymakers and, and let them decide what they want us to do. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Good to see you again. Um, so any other questions from um, the council? Uh, Madam Chair. So yes, go ahead, Vice Chair Charles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, um, Dave, for that information. Um, have any of the departments that you, uh, for the square footage that you oversee, have any of them ever reached out and talking about going towards more energy efficient electrification in any of the buildings or the departments? I understand you mentioned, and I did briefly touch on this, that each department has their own budget. 
Um, has any of them reached out to you in regards to transitioning to something like this? Yeah, we have had some conversations and, and it mostly relates to not electrification, but more, um, you know, energy efficiency reduction, looking at alternate, can we, you know, can we put solar out here? Can we do different things? So the, the agencies, uh, our customers are concerned about that. The big, you know, again, the big users of gas are these three main campuses and it's, it's an industrial um, it's, it's an industrial utilization. So it's those customers have not approached us to say, hey, can we switch? You know, the sheriff hasn't come to me and said, hey, can we um, shift Todd Road Jail from gas to um, electric? And, and I, I, I'm guessing, and you may, Public Works is in charge of this project, but, you know, they're building a whole new wing out there. My guess is they're putting in a brand new boiler, gas powered boiler out there for the needs they have to up upsize the system to support that and that project's underway and if if i was if i was going to guess or bet i would bet that that's going to be a brand new boiler um because that's the most at, when you look at it from an economic standpoint um gas is so much cheaper per therm than electricity like as i mentioned if we switched all of our um all of our big gas systems over to electricity it would have a huge impact on our bill now, um, uh, Council Member White, I do like the idea of looking at heat pumps because we have a good environment for that. Um, you know, there are challenges with heat pumps depending upon which type you use, whether you use a ground or air, air heat pumps, it, it causes different uh, challenges. But again, we haven't even had time to, to, to analyze that, uh, to look at that. You know, here at the government center, we would probably have to drill uh, a number of wells to do ground, um, uh, uh, ground-based heat pump. I don't think we have enough surface space on the top of our buildings to do an air-based heat pump system. Uh, again, that costs money. It does reduce the electric bill uh, because you're not switching it. You're not spending as much on electricity. But these are things that we we haven't. You know, we got like I said, we got this proposal um, late last week, and, and just really haven't had a time to look at it in detail. Um, in terms of and I understand you responded to Councilmember White's um, comment, but um, in terms of the county, the building that you oversee, the um, wiring electricity system that it currently has in place, if that, if this policy or recommendation was to go to before the board, how much are we looking at in order to rewiring the facilities, um, upgrading control panels, power panels in order to be able to meet these goals? I, you know, I, I couldn't even answer that question. We, we, you know, we would have to look at it. We'd probably be spending, you know, tens, tens to, you know, multiple tens of thousands to do, a, to do some engineering studies. Uh, we're more than likely going to need to add uh, more transformers to bring the main power in. Uh, we're going to have to increase the size of our emergency generators. Uh, in order to continue to support the system if we have a power outage. So it would be really difficult for me to, to give you an estimate, but I would say, you know, electrical main feeds and large transformers are not inexpensive. It would be, um, it would, it would be an investment. And I appreciate that response. And just to confirm the three facilities, Todd, the sheriff, the, the county sheriffs and the VCMC, that's not under your scope or is that is? Two of them are. Okay. The, the Todd Road Jail and the Government Center are part of my responsibility. The healthcare agency is not. And so the, the, um, what, what, what would happen if, if the board went down the road to make this investment, um, we would have to get budgetary authority to do this. And what would end up happening is um, our customers would eventually see an increase in their rent to cover the cost of recovering this investment. Now, there's ways the county could do it where they give us a general fund contribution and we don't have to pay, we don't have to collect it back from our customers, but the utility cost, if we did went, if we did in any place where we went electric and it increases the cost of their utilities, that would have to go into their annual budget. Okay, I appreciate that. And the only thing that I can think of that if something was to happen like that, that could be a negative impact on those departments if their rent costs go up. Um, again, thank you for the information. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So I saw Councilmember White's hand and then 
Councilmember Ferris. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to respond to Dave's comments, and I understand uh, that you haven't really had much uh, time to look at it. And I I, I want to repeat what you said that you liked. Uh, the concept of where feasible and certainly where feasible um, may not include um, the three big facilities, but it may be very feasible and economic for, for the smaller facilities. Um, in fact, we've seen recent information um, that the cost of retrofitting heat pump systems on the smaller systems, granted. Um, rooftop package equipment, for example, or furnaces. Replacing them with heat pump systems is actually less expensive than replacing with natural gas. So there are, there are buildings and systems where it does make um, economic sense right now and certainly we're we're not here for that we're here to suggest ways to um, to attack the climate change um, problem and so what I would suggest on this proposal is is to um, not ask that be it be voted on today uh, I heard Dave say he was concerned with the goals that were set forth in there, which are the goals um, in the climate action plan. Um, he sees them less as goals as more as mandates. So I would suggest that maybe um, um, that we meet with, with his staff to talk about how this might be reworded, restructured, in a way that does make sense for um, for county staff, and come back at a at a future meeting with more information. Okay, thank you, um, Councilmember Ferris. Yes, thank you. I would uh, I would generally probably support that uh, idea as well, uh, just to make sure that we're getting uh, collaboration. With I do have a few questions on it uh, for Mr. Sasek, if that's that's possible. So I know the way you were kind of describing it is that if I were to be in a position to where I've got my gas system and electrical system and they cost the same, I'm going to go to the electrical. Um, the challenge I'm having is that. The electrical systems, if they are the least impactful for GHD uh, emissions, which is kind of the mandate of what we've been asked to evaluate and, and to help with understanding policy, like that's never going to happen if it turns out that some other system is is the most economical. Like if it, if if the if the least impactful to GHG emissions were the most economical one, we would obviously pick that one. Is that probably a fair assumption? Yeah, yeah, and so again, my I don't set policy. So if the county um, board says our policy is we're gonna we're gonna switch to electrification, then it then it doesn't become a question for me to do the economic analysis because the board has already set policy and said this is the policy, right? If the board sets policy and that says GSA, I want you to to make the most um, economic um, uh, decision, uh, then we have to weigh the economics of it. So I, I, and I follow the policy of the board. Sure, there, there, there's probably, and I'm just trying to think of it because it's a whatever we action we have, we have to think about the economics because that's like, if you can't pay for it, it ain't gonna happen, right? So, but at, at a minimum, there's like, the board can say retrofit everything, like go, go and replace everything and they're going to figure out how to get you money if they really care about it. Or there's a level below, which was what the previous discussion was, was, was if you are already thinking about it and you are already budgeting these things, should you consider evaluating and potentially prioritizing those elements? Or then that there's third one, which is the lowest bar, which is save the most amount of money, go with the system that, that doesn't cost as much. Um, the board can pick whatever the policy is right. with respect to if I were if 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 part of the evaluation of this and kind of merging some of these comments together would be that when considering 
upgrades, enhancements, maintenance, or other changes to those energy systems, uh, infrastructure that for existing buildings facilities, that electrification of the buildings facilities would be evaluated and prioritized. Would that give you significant heartburn if it turns out that that's where the, the board no, would go? No, I think that's a reasonable um, directive. I also think considering um, end of life replacement and, 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 you know, that gives like, like these boilers they just put in the, the new hospital wing, they're probably good for 25 or 30 years. I don't know. I mean, they're long life. Um, sure, sure. So, so it, it, you know, if we have a, a provision that says at end of life replacement, you know, consider or even, you know, could mandate that, then we just have to figure out how to put that in the budget. And it's, right. it's a policy. It makes it easier for the, the uh, for K Man and her group to say, well, you're just complying with policy, so we have to find the budget to make that happen. Yeah. So your point but, is well yeah. taken. Yeah. Yeah. My last part of only is that I want to make sure that we're informed. I mean, the board makes the policy, but you know, they're the ones responsible for what that policy is. And we want to make sure that it, it's a thinking of all of these factors uh, to make sure that it's reasonable and we can actually make a difference. So uh, appreciate the back and forth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So if there aren't any other questions from the council, then let's go ahead and continue with public comments. And um, excuse me if I don't have this in order, but I see this on my screen. So Todd Pollard, um, followed by Wayne Morgan, Don Price, and Judy. Go ahead, Todd. Uh, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I appreciate uh, Council Member, uh, I said, Commissioner White, going forward with the mandate, as I've understood it too, that your body is there to supplement what was set out in the climate action plan and look for any other improvements possible. So I, I really think that's the mandate that I would hope you pursue. There's so many opportunities out there need to be you know, followed up on or brought to the attention of the decision makers, the board of supervisors and so forth. So that I believe is your job with input and pressure from citizens like me. Um, we're the ones who are sitting back here uh, listening to this. I'm encouraged by the fact that you all are taking a very serious look at this. Uh, Mr. Sasek is, I think, giving a very realistic and thoughtful response to your questions. That's good for my sense. I think the most disturbing thing I heard was his current understanding of policy is that you go electric unless it costs more money. That's kind of summarizing it. So right now, as a climate citizen activist, I'm saying, we're screwed. It's always gonna cost more to change over to electricity, particularly on these big systems, and we'll never get out of this. We're just gonna keep pushing more gas through these old systems, these boilers, nearly new, or in the case of the Todd Road Jail, that's a travesty that we're, we built into that system 25 years of gas usage for heating instead of starting fresh, paying more, but at least helping us get out of this cycle of creating more greenhouse gas emissions. So that was disturbing to me. And I think any kind of policy that's more explicit is the better. I was a county employee for 35 years and struggled, worked on this general plan and, and many other things in the planning department. Explicit policy from the board of supervisors of what counts. If you've got contentious tests, arguments, debates over projects between planning and public works, Planning rarely wins because public works has got the big bulldozers, et cetera. But if there's clear policy that planning believes should be pushed forward, that's what we would argue. And without that, it's more or less business as usual. So clear policy, uh, as Phil is trying to, I think, achieve here is very important. It's also important to understand and reiterate what Mr. Sasek said is that every department, I use the planning department as a case example, pays rent and for all the costs that he outlined, which makes sense. And everybody, any department head wanted those rent costs reduced. And because those rent costs also had to be reflected in hourly charge rates for cost recovery systems. And I worked on that part in the planning department. So if you've got a lot of rent you've got to cover, you've got to build that into the hourly fees that your employees are charging for public services if that's an allowed uh, function. And it was in many departments in the county. So that rent's important. In the, uh, department heads are pushing to keep the rent down, but they don't have a say over which systems get designed and, and implemented. That's where having this policy come into play, I think would be absolutely essential. Where I think the department heads do have choices, 
when it comes to, again, items, things in Mr. Sissick's department, and that is um, vehicles. I've watched county parks people in the county parks up the coast where I have it for a lot of time, big lumbering F-150 Ford pickups, and they've carried you know, one trash can and some buckets to clean out the toilets. Why, why using a huge pickup when there were smaller pickups available? Well, the big ones are now phased out and the smaller ones are there, of course, now just the head of the availability of electric ones. So it's always somewhat of a policy decision based on department heads, public works people who are going out with water resources and pickups. Do you need a great big pickup? Building and safety inspectors, planning code enforcement people. Well, we, want to, we don't want to get stuck someplace and not have enough electricity in the original electric vehicles that were given to us by Toyota. That's changed now. So department's heads need to be you know, tested. I think a policy equivalent to, it's gotta be electric unless you can justify otherwise. That's kind of, I would argue that should be the mandate for the fleet services. If you need a three ton truck and that kind of work you're doing doesn't, can't be met with an electric vehicle, okay, you get the pass. Similarly, I think the energy uh, direction that Phil was trying to produce also falls in that same category. It's electric unless you can demonstrate otherwise. Now the otherwise does include the feasibility of it, costing these things out and actual legitimate replacement. But I do think there's ways in which you can reach a halfway step. And I'm thinking about heating water for laundry services, things like that at the jail and the hospital. That's where solar hot water heating systems could augment the boilers and perhaps reduce the gas flow that comes through those. So while you can't cut off the gas because it'd be horrendously expensive to put electrical replacements in there. At least you can moderate the use demand for gas by supplement it with preheating solar systems, for example. The hospital's got a lot of empty ground in the upper parking lots near Foothill Boulevard, and there may be other locations too, but I think that's something that should be considered. Um, Bob, can you wrap up on your comments? Because yes, I will. Other people, right. thank you. I, I think also the budget, is a critical thing. We're talking about money and that's important. And how you, I don't say jiggle the budget, but how things are accounted for. I don't think the county now has a, a budget item where any savings through efficiencies, electrification or more efficient equipment where those savings gets banked and then might be used to help fund new improved savings, for example. Uh, there's ideas of subsidies. County subsidizes various things. And if you had to dip into a subsidy fund that would get us over the, the hump in terms of going electric versus staying with gas, it might be just another budgetary consideration. So I think CEOs, budget people should be key players in any of this review. I guess the last thing too is that every council member you have might have ideas they want to pursue. And I'd urge them to engage with us and the public who are really very, very interested and concerned about doing the best job possible. We can help you with ideas, raise questions, tip you off to maybe things we're unaware of, but encourage you since Clay has a big list of all of us, that anyone who wants to engage in programs like Phil outlined, engage people on the engineer system, get us involved in kind of workshopping things to begin with. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have Wayne Morgan followed by, um, I believe it's Don Price. And then uh, there was another hand up, but I do see Haley, oh, Judy, yes, Judy. And then Haley, go ahead. Uh, hello, count, uh, council members. Uh, I fully support uh, building electrification. Uh, we can't afford to put into place gas infrastructure that's gonna last for decades, adding more carbon dioxide to the already over carbon dioxide atmosphere. I also strongly support declaring a climate emergency. And why is it an emergency? Well, carbon dioxide lives in the atmosphere for centuries. Uh, estimates are 300 years to over a thousand years. So what we do now is going to affect the Earth for, you know, hundreds of hundreds of years. So we can't continue to just dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, and you can see the extreme events uh, are growing uh, day by day. Um, just in the last 20 years, I was looking at a a chart of the carbon dioxide levels versus temperature. In just the last 20 years, our carbon dioxide levels have increased about a quarter of what above what they were before. 
the 1880s, and the delta in temperature was half of half a degree Celsius between 2020 and uh, 20, 2000 and 2020. It, it, and we're at 1.1. I mean, we're we're going to get beyond 1.5 in no time. And the uh, uh, international intergovernmental panel on climate change has warned us that 1.5 is not a good place to be. Um, and the technology is here to to uh, eliminate gas infrastructure from buildings. Uh, I've converted my house uh, to all electric. I replaced my furnace with a with a heat pump and got air conditioning as a bonus. And I have a, a heat pump, a water heater, induction stove, and electric dryer. I have solar panels and a battery, two electric vehicles. I'm energy independent. I generate five uh, megawatts, megawatt hours a year more than I use. So I'm a net generator. And you know this is the way to go in the future. That's the way to become energy independent, truly. You're not going to be energy independent with fossil fuels because you've always got the fossil fuel industry uh, prices, uh, which are dictated by, uh, you know, the world market. Um, as far as um, some of the comments that uh, Dave Sussex uh, mentioned, he's concerned about costs and goals uh, of 2030. Ithaca, New York has a goal to electrify uh, buildings by 2030. That includes governmental buildings and residential buildings. So that's even retrofits. And what they did, they consulted a company called Block Power, who helped in the planning and the financing for those uh, retrofits and conversions. And I think that's something that we should look at, is looking at a company that does this day in and day out, and they can you know, finance it because the savings that you gain will help pay for the financing in the future. Um, so, uh, Wayne, can you wrap up here? Because we have. I am. I'm, I'm wrapping Thank it up you. right now. So, I, I think it's urgent that we take action now. Um, you know, this is not. Chair, I've lost uh, audio for Mr. Morgan. Yeah, I think he's frozen here. Um, all right, so let's go on to um, Don Price, followed by Haley, or followed by Judy, and then Haley. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Snap. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Council Member White a question. I'm looking at the proposal uh, that came with the agenda packet. And proposal one says the county shall support the transition to zero net energy and zero net carbon buildings, including electrification of new and existing buildings, as well as county owned facilities. So does this mean that all new and existing buildings in the unincorporated area are included in your proposal? Um. Thanks for the question, Don. No, uh, this is county facilities only. Uh, the second item, uh, item 14, deals with other buildings in the unincorporated area. This would be okay, so I'm reading that wrong. And you, other might clarify that. you might want to clarify that, I guess. I, I read it the other way. So, okay. And one other comment, really quick, uh, Mr. Sezik. Um, it seems to me that every other single general services manager in the entire world is saying the same thing. It's gonna to be too expensive, we can't do it. And um, it seems to me that he should know a little bit more about what's going on with zero carbon uh, facilities because the county does have or did have climate action plans in the past. I believe they passed one in 2010, which should have given at least an indication that some of these agency directors should be paying attention to what zero emission or zero carbon uh, facilities might look like. So having him not know what's going on on this is seems irresponsible to me. So I'm really disappointed. And the fact is that we are having an actual emergency and things are gonna cost money. It's gonna be expensive. It's gonna cost money. And the more you wait, 
the more expensive it's going to get. So I would suggest to stop complaining about how expensive it's going to be and start make, taking action to actually do something because it's not going to get any cheaper sitting around waiting and complaining about it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let's go on to Judy Howard, followed by Haley Ellers. I think you're on mute, Judy. Thank you. Um, I do feel like we need to look at the bigger picture here. And I think that one, one phrase that comes to mind is that good government policy is not just looking at the initial cost, but the long range savings to the people, including the environment, the budget, fire safety, and health. And using a word like feasible in some of this could be so ambiguous, but a big point that nobody has brought up, and I hope you'll take this in a really creative way, is the idea that the more we can do this in our systems, we will be able to create jobs from using these new concepts. And that's a terrific thing for this economy and for this world. And you know, I was thinking about something really silly, but remember back and we see pictures of the gas lamps that they used to have back in, I don't know, I guess it was the turn of the century and they changed over to electric light posts. Well, a lot of this seems so, um, difficult to imagine, but I'm imagining a world where we're getting people to work on new, new uh, concepts in a way to live and a way to get this world to a better place. And I hope you'll consider that. Thank you, Judy. Go ahead, Haley, you're next. Hi, my name is Haley Ehlers. I'm a Ventura County resident and representing Climate First Replacing Oil and Gas, or CFROG, an environmental advocacy nonprofit with over 2,000 members throughout the region. And I realize that you may not be voting, um, actually voting on this recommendation right now, but I just want to comment in support of Council Member White's proposal to revise the three general plan policies to better reduce greenhouse gases um, from Ventura County facilities. Building electrification is a necessary next step in creating a sustainable, thriving, and healthy community. Locally, this, this specific proposal is heavily supported by the county expediating their reach code to require all electric new construction. The city of Ojai's upcoming vote to eliminate most of the exemptions that exist in their current reach code, meaning that even more buildings will be electric ready there. And dozens of community members advocating for electrification at various local jurisdictions, including particularly at the cities of Oxnard and Ventura. Additionally, the Board of Supervisors have already shown support for utilizing clean energy in county facilities by voting to use electricity from 100% renewable sources in all buildings and phasing out gas powered fleet vehicles. Despite industry's attempts to market natural gas as a safe bridge fuel, which um, in this deliberation seems like it's obviously been persuasive, but despite these attempts, it, it clearly is a fossil fuel. It's unsafe for our climate and our health and fossil fuel in commercial and residential buildings contribute 24% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. And as um, Council Member White pointed out, a significant amount of our county emissions as well. And reducing this, the burning of natural gas can dramatically improve said emissions as quantified in this proposal. In addition to the harmful impacts of our atmosphere, there's been increasing research confirming the harmful effects of things like combustion pollution inside of buildings leading to asthma and respiratory diseases and the safety and health of Ventura County residents, including their staff members who work in these buildings is the Board of Supervisors number one priority and the reason, the, really the reason they exist. So electrifying existing buildings is a clear and necessary way to operate towards this mission. Bold, lastly, bold and necessary proposals like this are what the Ventura County community has been advocating from you, or, from you and your emergency council for the past few months. So thank you for hearing us and we look forward to your future recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. And then I do see uh, Roseanne Witt, your hand is up, go ahead. Thank you. I would like to urge, urge um, whatever is necessary to work towards supporting 
uh, both agenda items 13 and 14 to electrify county owned facilities and to expand county programs for electrification of existing residential and commercial buildings. Together, these proposals feel, fill glaring emissions in our existing climate action plan. Methane from fossil gas burned in our buildings is 104 times more potent than carbon dioxide at heating our atmosphere over a 10 year period. The time frame in which scientists warn we must cut greenhouse gas pollution 43% to have any hope of limiting global heating enough to avoid irreversible impacts, including less snowmelt, more aridification, wildfires, and tree die-offs that will trigger cascading, self-reinforcing feedback loops, speeding mm -hmm. catastrophic climate breakdown. Read the technical report of IPC's February climate report, and you will conclude that you do not want to live in a 1.5 degree world. You probably can't live in a two degree world, and we are very likely headed for a three or four degree world. Ventura County's vast system of wells, pipelines, compressor stations carelessly leak and purposely release large amounts of methane throughout the production, storage, transportation, and use continuum, including inside our buildings where methane gas appliances leak toxic indoor air pollution that increases childhood asthma risk, even when turned off. Worryingly, a recent Supreme Court ruling preemptively constrains EPA's authority to respond to evolving climate science, making immediate and comprehensive county climate leadership even more imperative. IPCC calls for strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in methane as the fastest strategy to lower global heating. It's also the single biggest, cheapest way to cut climate mitigation and adaptation costs. It will save lives and improve health through improved air quality, local food security, and lowering heat stress. Please heed IPCC's warnings and recommend policies and programs to cut methane emissions through electrification of all types of Ventura County buildings to strengthen our climate action plan. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. And then I see Francis. Go ahead, Francis. Hi there. Um, I'm Francis Lee. I live in Moore Park. And um, I, I, I applaud everybody who's talked about um, this climate action. And uh, thank you to Phil White for bringing th this concern up. Um, Moore Park doesn't have a climate action plan in their general plan. So we're relying on our nearest neighbor, which is Thousand Oaks. And they're, they're relying on Ventura County or Ventura or Ventura County for their voice on electrification and, of buildings, which is a major part of our ability to decarbonize and to reduce emissions. Um, the other part is the transportation. Those are the main uh, ways. And um, yeah, I, I, I just want to reiterate that we're, we're at your mercy, really. Um, so acting locally really is, is the way to go. And we're just waiting for this to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, any other comments from the public? I don't see any hands raised, but I do see your hand, Council Member White. Go ahead. Uh, to bring this to a close, uh, this item, I, I think uh, I would like to pull it and um, offer to meet with, uh, with Dave Sasek and um, county staff and see if we can figure out a way to put together a policy um, that makes sense to them that they would recognize as board policy to enable the ability of um, building electrification to move forward. So I think we could do that and I'll bring it back hopefully next month. Uh, go ahead, uh, Council Member Ferris. Thank you, um, uh, actually in, 
I think just as some comments for direction of, of the offline discussion that, that'll happen. I'm very supportive of, of these of these policies that we have here to recommend to the board on the direction of electrification. My key thing that I want to make sure that we are able to do is I want to see that it will be effective, a policy that can be put in place and it's effective. If it turns out that we've recommended a policy and even if the board approves it and it's very bold and very ambitious, but no money's put behind it, which means it never gets implemented, it will not do anything. And so I want to make sure that we have a policy that is fully supportive that will actually be effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and we achieve our goals. So that whatever we come out with, whatever we support and encourage the board to do, to have full-throated and uh, uh, support for enacting it and having it be effective. So that's the only aspect of just incorporating that into the, the language that comes back to us. I think it'd be good if you uh, included yourself in the meetings with uh, county staff, Mitt. Let me know when you're talking. I can, uh, I'm happy to, happy to be part of that. Great. Thank you. You know, I um, I support what Councilmember Ferris said. You know, I like the terms feasible. I like the terms consideration and evaluation. And I believe there's nuggets um, that have been shared today, as well as shared by Mr. Sasset. So thank you so much. And yes, Councilmember Baldwin, I do see your hand up. Go right ahead. I just want to uh, fully agree with what Councilmember. Paris just said that it needs to work. It, you need to get reductions, not just talk. And so I'm, it's difficult. I understand the budget woes that people face, but we're facing other woes in the climate and, and um, the counties and others, everybody's gonna have to make financial contributions to get this world moving forward rather than backwards. So we'll go ahead and not take action on this item and see it come back in a revised format. And so um, we uh, put that back on Council Member White uh, to bring that back to this group. Well, hopefully it's it's me and it's Clay to, uh, to enable um, moving this forward. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so Matt, seeing Matt that Jared, we are... Yes, go ahead. I, 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 I do unfortunately have a hard stop. I need to drop at it. I, if I can, I know that item 14 will be coming up. I'm, uh, I, I will offer my same comments in the context of that if it turns out there needs to be further discussion on it, but um, I will need to drop it this time. Okay, all right. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Ferris. Um, so yes, we still have a couple of items on the agenda. We have item number 14. And we are just five minutes away, four minutes away from two o'clock. Um, so I want to maybe pull the, the remaining uh, committee members. We have five of us still here. We're just, are we at quorum if we have five play? Quorum is half plus one. We have eight current members. So we do need five people for a quorum. Okay, if we so go right below that, then we are no longer quorum. Yeah, so right now we have four. Oh, five. Okay, five with um, with P. Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I I would only say that just based off of the last discussion, um, question to Council Member White, if he feels that the next item, item fourteen, should be put forth, or if we should also continue that item to the next meeting. Um, I, I kind of share the same sentiments that Council Member Ferris said right before he left that um, there could still be a few more holes that still need to be addressed um, and cleaned up. So I don't know if we want to put that question to Council Member White, and then we could just bring those two items back at a future meeting. Um, that way we can sort of all finish at a reasonable time because I know we all still have things to do and we appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, you're welcome. So council member White, could we um, have you consider uh, bringing back 14 as well? Okay, let me, let me just introduce it. And yes, I'm agreeable to, um, 
to bring it back later, but let me introduce it. Oh, can I can I introduce it as the chair of the of this group? So let me go ahead and introduce item number 14, request for BCCEC to approve a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to create a program to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from existing residential and non-residential buildings. Go ahead. Okay, again, this is this is dealing with the blue part of the greenhouse gas emission pie chart. Um, you don't need to put it up, Clay. Um, the, the county staff already has a program you know, contained in the CEO's office sustainability division to um, address energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions in existing residential buildings. And it's called 3CREN. And we have had uh, a presentation to our, our council previously. And the proposal item 14 is to expand um, what the county staff is already doing to, to put some goals in front of them for greenhouse gas emission reductions that are consistent with what's in the, the county climate action plan. And particularly to expand the scope of the the program to include non-residential buildings. I'm not talking about county government facilities here. These are all the buildings in the unincorporated areas owned by private individuals and companies. Um, I know that the county staff has applied to the Public Utilities Commission uh, for funding in future years. Um, for the possibility of getting money and a lot of money, millions, to, to address this. Um, I'm suggesting that we ask the board to make this a program um, to, to direct staff to, to do this program. It's not presently in the climate action plan. Um, so that's what it's about. Uh, it's, it's the same thrust as um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from county government facilities. Um, it can be done. Uh, the county's already done a good job of, uh, of attacking this. Just want to expand that. That's all I'm going to say. I'll bring it back next time. Okay, so we'll bring back item number 14 as well. So just wrapping up then this, um, this agenda, we have item number 15, unless there's anything that any of the council members would like to make a comment on. Um, just a quick minute. Go Madam ahead. Chair. Yes, Vice Chair. Um, just real quick, um, I, I, I understand climate change is a very important thing. Everyone has an opinion and they want their voice heard and I respect that 100% as a member of the public as well as serving on multiple boards. But I would recommend in order to, because we only allow two hours for our meetings, that we do set time limits for public comments. Uh, I believe three minutes is reasonable. It is the same standard that multiple cities and jurisdictions do is three minutes. Again, we only allow two hours for our meetings and we end up having a lot of our council members drop off after two o'clock and it could make us inefficient. So I would recommend that we do that. I would also recommend that the correspondence section of our agenda be more of as an info consent that we don't have to touch on it unless the council member actually says, I wanna speak on this particular item, just so that we keep our agenda moving very, very smoothly and as quickly as possible. Again, we only have two hours, so we wanna make sure that we make the best out of that time frame. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anyone else on the council for item number 15? Yes, Council Member White. Uh, yes, a couple of, of items for for future for future agenda items. And um, these have been mentioned before. Um, I provided a list uh, months ago for possible future um, items, including uh, dealing with embodied carbon. This is the carbon that is uh, contained within building materials um, due to production and transportation and, and manufacturing. 
um, is a major source of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So to do something on that, I think is important. Um, today, reading the Washington Post, and maybe Clay, you could you could put up the screenshot of uh, what was on my iPhone this morning, and that deals with declaration of a climate emergency. I know we are the the climate emergency council, so it's kind of implied that that we're dealing with the emergency, the real emergency of of climate change. Um, and however, the, the Board of Supervisors has not, if, if you could back that up, there you go. Uh, this, this is today's news. And I think that, that our council should be uh, asking the Board of Supervisors to declare a climate emergency here in the county. And I would intend to bring back something at our next meeting. Uh, the third thing I would like to um, ask for is in the climate action plan was the, the policy decision by the board and the general plan to adopt a reach code. I know the county staff has, has been working on this, I believe with a consultant, outside consultant. And I think um, I would like to get a report to understand uh, what's in there um, because there are reach codes and there are reach codes. And I think that, that our group um, should be informed about what, what is intended by, uh, by county planning to uh, put before the board. Those are the things I have. Okay, thank you so much. And so with that, then anyone else on the council with uh, comments here at this point? All right, um, we have uh, public comments here for this item. Item number 15, we're gonna ask public if they have anything to keep it to a minimum of one minute, if there's anything here. Yes, uh, Judy, you have one minute, thank you. I have one minute. I'm not talking about that item, though. I'm concerned that we encourage the public participation and not start making big limits on that. We need people to be involved. OK, thank you. Um, yes, uh, Council Member White. Thank you, Sylvia. Well, I'm certainly in favor of not limiting our meetings to two hours because We've run up against um, two o'clock too many times without getting done, getting through everything that that we should have. You know, um, Council Member White, I appreciate the healthy dialogue that we had in these items. And sometimes the dialogue is really worth it to extend then or push the other items uh, forward to another meeting because I really enjoyed the discussion today. And so um, I know uh, we had intentionally originally had these meetings scheduled, I think on a quarterly basis, and we felt that that wasn't enough time. So we ratcheted into monthly. And I know my calendar can, can only sustain about two to two point, you know, two five hours there. Um, I can't really go to a three o'clock meeting. So I wanna make sure that, you know, we're, we're okay with staff and their time allocated for this commission. Um, so with that then, yes, go ahead, Clay, you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to add in that if, if there's separate things or if we want to agendize a discussion to talk about operationally how how long the meetings are or anything like that, we can. I wanted to also point out that if if there is direction from this council on maintaining the remote meetings versus having hybrid meetings or something like that, please advise me um, for future agenda items while we're on this topic. I wanted to put in there, too, that we do have a guest speaker scheduled, tentatively scheduled for next month. It's going to be from uh, Congressman Salute Carbajal's office to speak to us on climate issues at the federal level. So we can perhaps get some insights from Wendy Mata on that, on what could be leveraged here locally and through understanding federal issues. And then this group has talked about a couple of different times off and on the idea of doing a meeting remotely at Gold Coast Transit District and speaking to county council. I wanted to let you all know that we can do that. It would probably have to be on site as a special meeting. So that means members of the public would be welcome to attend too. So to be able to do that, but it would be a special meeting. 
Um, it would probably not be something that we've agendized at this point. So I wanted to report that out and see if there's an interest to pursue doing something like that, perhaps in the August, September area. And if so, if there's a day, in, day of week, preferred time frame and duration for that sort of a special meeting to occur. I know we're already over on time, but I didn't want to wait any longer than I have to on that and see if I can get some input from this council. Uh, so council, any input for play on this item? Madam Chair, I, in, in respecting everyone's time, I think we can all email Clay our requests, our desires for that. Um, I think that would probably be the most appropriate approach that way we can do time management. Thank you. Yeah, I would support you know anything that the commission wants to do. All right. So with that, then let's go ahead and wrap up. Item number sixteen is adjourned, and so we'll adjourn then to our next meeting scheduled here in August. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Good job, Sylvia. Thank you.